So we start our analysis by looking at near 2D fixed points. This is analogous to the linearization we did near fixed points in the 1D system. You could do linearization in 2D systems. I'd say, this is a nonlinear class. Why are we linearizing? Well, we get insight into nonlinear things by linearizing first. Go back to the way that I wrote it out in scalar form. If X and Y are our variables, then we have X dot is a nonlinear function near a fixed point, X star, Y star. And it may not be the origin, but we can translate our coordinates. So we pick some new coordinates, but we'll just relabel them as X and Y. So the dynamics is a 2D linear system. What do I mean by a linear 2D system? Instead of looking nonlinear like this, so this is, this is in section 5.2, Strogatz. I'll write it as a, a vector at first. X dot equals a, a matrix. X, so this is a linear system. If we were to write it out in terms of X and Y, we have X dot and Y dot. I'll write it this way. AX plus BY. Y dot equals CX plus DY. A, B, C, and D here are all constants. In matrix form, this looks like... A, B, C, D, X, Y. The matrix A. A, B, C, D. We want to find some special directions from this matrix. Um, in particular, we want to find special directions where trajectories leave or approach our fixed point the fastest. So if you if you look at you know this system or in the matrix form or this that's does it component by component, I want you to notice for the linear system the origin is a fixed point, the only fixed point, which makes sense. As part of linearization, we transform our coordinates. So the origin is the fixed point we found in the nonlinear system. And so linearizing around it, the origin is the fixed point, And we'll look for special directions where trajectories leave or approach our fixed point the fastest. What do I mean? Let me write this in its you know, the matrix form. X dot equals uh, a X. Suppose we have some direction. Let's gonna plot. Here's our here's our origin, zero zero. And there's some direction v that if we start along there, we will end along there. So if x t is e to the lambda t v. And then take the derivative of that x dot equals d by dt of x, but we'll put in this right hand side over here, e to the lambda t v. v is a, doesn't, it doesn't depend on x, it's just a direction. We could pull out the v and then we're left with d by dt of e to the lambda t. This is v lambda e to the lambda t. So we're left with lambda times x. So this would be a special direction. If we start out in the direction V, then we just continue along V. So this, that means that this is a solution for some special lambda and special V. And if you've taken courses related to eigenvectors and eigenvalues, then you know that that's what V is. V is an eigenvector corresponding to eigenvalue lambda. In this case, lambda is real doesn't have to be real. So the direction V is an eigenvector of the matrix A corresponding to eigenvalue lambda. If we have A operating on V, then we will get a scalar lambda times V. So here's V, and if we operate on that by A, AV equals, it just sort of stretches. So we've stretched this by a factor lambda. Here I've shown lambda, you know, looking greater than zero. Won't always be that way. So the general method for finding eigenvectors and eigenvalues is you solve the characteristic equation for the matrix. So that means you just, you take AV equals lambda V and then rewrite it. A minus lambda and I'll write this uh, I as the identity matrix times V equals the zero vector. So I is a two by two identity matrix. If you haven't seen it, I equals one, one, zero, zero. The characteristic equation for A 
you need to get the determinant of this a minus lambda i. And the determinant, let's plug in little a, little b, little c, little d minus lambda, some zeros. Write this in terms of d minus lambda. So that's be the, these large bars on the side mean we're taking the determinant. We get a minus lambda times d minus lambda minus bc. To find the characteristic equation, this determinant is set equal to zero. If we rewrite this, we'll have a second order polynomial. So we get a lambda squared minus a plus d lambda plus a d minus b c. And we can notice some things. What is a and d? That's actually the trace of a. Trace of a is the sum of the diagonal entries. And we'll call that tau. a d minus b c is actually the determinant of a. We'll call that delta. So the characteristic equation for a two by two matrix, we can write it as lambda squared minus tau lambda plus delta equals zero. It's a second order polynomial for lambda, which is what we would expect if we had an n by n matrix, we should have an nth order polynomial that has n roots, the n eigenvalues here, n equals two. So we can solve for lambda. This is relatively simple because it is just a, a quadratics. We could use the quadratic formula. So lambda one comma two, there's two. And we have one half, uh, what would this be? Tau plus or minus square root tau squared minus four delta. We have two roots. In general, they'll be different and they'll each have their own corresponding eigenvector. It would be a special case if we have a repeated root. It would also be a special case if one of them equals zero. But in general, we'll have lambda one not equal to lambda two and neither equals zero. And they've had corresponding eigenvectors that are both different. You find these eigenvectors by, once you found lambda one, you would plug in a minus lambda one, v1 uh, equals zero. And then you could solve for v1. I guess let's just put i, because you could solve for each one. The nice thing about finding the eigenvectors and eigenvalues is that the solutions of x dot equals ax can be written in terms of them. So e to the lambda one t v plus e to the lambda two t v two. So we have a superposition. This c1 and c2 are both constants. I am assuming here that lambda one and lambda two are real. So we're for now ignoring the case where they could be complex. They could be and we'll, we'll talk about that. Then we could talk about the different cases of the signs of lambda one and lambda two and what it means for what the, the phase portrait next to the fixed point looks like, or in this case, the phase portrait near the origin. So behavior of trajectories near the fixed points, which would be another way of saying like the local phase portrait depends on the sign of the eigenvalues. So let's consider this case of lambda two is less than lambda one. They're both less than zero. So they're negative. Let me sketch picture X, Y, and I'm just gonna you know, give two directions. So let's say this is V one and maybe this is V two. Then typical trajectories will be, let me draw this orange here, green here. Trajectories will be collapsing into the origin and we can't cross these two lines. So I'm just giving sort of a sampling of what things are doing. Everything is coming into the origin. It's exponential decay from all directions uh, onto uh, origin. This situation is called a stable node, meaning we would call the fixed point a stable node. So this will end up giving us a classification for fixed points in 2D. What kind of equilibrium are they? 
and some idea of how trajectories are moving. So stable means, okay, we get it. Things are going toward it. Node is a special way that the trajectories are approaching. They approach um, in this way. There's usually a, a slow direction and a fast direction. So the in this way that I've drawn it, I think V1, because it corresponds to the number that's not as negative, this is the slow direction. You might call that the slow eigen direction. And then the green one would be the fast eigen direction. So if I were to plot this better, here's the fast, here's the slow, things are quickly coming on the fast direction. So we might put the arrows, you know, double arrows. Things are approaching the origin, which is stable, fast, and they're approaching less fast. So that means the trajectories are actually coming in and then they're quickly coming in directions parallel to the green one, and then more slowly along orange directions. And that's kind of the characteristic you expect from a, a node. I don't know why it's called a node. You could also have an unstable node. So this was a stable node. An unstable node uh, has the arrows flipped if you want, and also the signs. So that it would be lambda one is greater than zero and lambda two is greater than even that. So just change the arrows. You have an unstable node. So the point is unstable and everything is going away from it. And there's a direction in which things are quickly going away and a direction in which things are less quickly. And notice these don't have to be orthogonal. They would be orthogonal if A had some special structure, if it was a symmetric matrix, but A is not necessarily a symmetric matrix. So the green and the orange direction could actually be very close to each other. The angle between them could be small. So yeah, if we reverse the arrows, then you get the idea of what's going on. So that's an unstable node. So I mean, let's call that one case. That's kind of the node case. I'm treating them both as one. Here's another case. This would be, we'll say lambda two is less than zero. Lambda one is greater than zero. So we can first say it in words, we would have exponential decay along the V2 direction, but exponential growth or departure if you want along the V1 direction. So if I were to do a sketch that in the X and Y, let's call this V1, right? And that we're talking about the span of that. So it's this line going in both directions. And then here's V2, it's an eigen direction. If I were to draw arrows to represent how things are coming in or approaching, things are approaching along V2, but leaving along the V1 direction. They're leaving in both directions. So nearby trajectories will look like this. They'll be coming in kind of parallel to V2 and then leaving parallel to the V1. Coming in along V2 and then leaving along V1. It's called a saddle point. I do not have a horse's saddle, but if I did and I dropped a marble on it, there's going to be directions where it kind of goes to the middle of the saddle and then other directions where it falls off. I wish I could draw something like that. I don't think I can very well. <laughs> okay, maybe you kind of get the idea. There's directions along which things are leaving. So that would be analogous to the V1 directions. There's directions along which things are coming in. That would be like the, the V2 directions. So a marble on a horse's saddle right, is gonna kind of fall and then go that way, depending on where you drop it. So it's called a saddle point. These two cases, the nodes and the saddle points involved eigenvalues that are real. We could have eigenvalues that are complex valued. And that's a little bit harder to consider because the eigenvectors that you get will also be complex valued. So you need to handle it in a special way, something called generalized eigenvectors. Because in this space, we can only have real directions, not imaginary directions. We can still have imaginary eigenvalues though. So if lambda one 
and lambda 2 are complex valued, then that means we can get what's called oscillatory or center behavior or spirals. When you have complex valued eigenvalues, they come in pairs, right? They have to because A is real. So you'll have lambda 2 will be the complex conjugate of lambda 1. They come in complex conjugate pairs. And you don't have special directions like a V1 or V2. It's actually the whole plane does some special behavior. So that means the local space either is, it's all, the complex valued part, at least the imaginary part, is related to rotation. And one could do an analysis of the matrix to see that. I just want to give you the upshot for now. So you get oscillatory solutions, completely oscillatory, meaning closed orbits, or spirals. And this literally means things are spiraling. So we could have an oscillatory case where things are just circulating around. This case is called a center. Like the thing above was called a saddle point. This would be called a center point. I don't know necessarily the terminology. It looks kind of like a target and that's the center of the target. Spirals, just like with nodes, there's a stable node and an unstable node. You could have a stable spiral. So this center point is uh, the bottom position of the pendulum is the center point because at least in the absence of damping, this thing will oscillate back and forth forever. Oscillations of pendulum near the downward position. You could also have stable and unstable spirals. So a stable spiral is just that. It's The shape is a spiral. So trajectories, all trajectories near the fixed point are spiraling in. So this is called a stable spiral. We need to put arrows. The arrows tell us what's going on because you could also have an unstable spiral. Unstable spiral would be things are moving out. And they're not always going you know, clockwise the way that I've drawn them. You could have counterclockwise. So that's an unstable spiral. So a stable spiral would be what you get for the bottom position of the pendulum when you add some realistic damping. Like this thing settles down and everything goes to that fixed point. In fact, there's a lot of friction in my hand holding it. So unstable spiral. Yeah. Okay, you could also have, and this wouldn't be terribly exciting at all. You can have lambda one, and lambda two are both zero, which means that you can only have this if x dot equals zero and y dot equals zero. So you've got like the the boring, the most boring vector field in the world. Everywhere is a fixed point. So everywhere, you know, what it's, what's a face portrait? Yeah, it's just a bunch of dots because nothing's going anywhere. Now there is an important note. This is only for the linear system. If you actually were linearizing and came with uh, eigenvalues that are both zero, it probably means that you need to look at terms beyond linear in your Taylor series expansion of the dynamics near that point. So it's not, in general, it's not going to be a case that, oh, everywhere is a fixed point. It means that you have to go beyond linear. You have to do a nonlinear analysis. So maybe we'll make that kind of note or tale of warning. Eigenvalues of zero are a danger sign. If this is from a linearization of a nonlinear system, you need to consider higher order terms to get the local phase space. And by higher order terms, I mean higher than linear, higher than first order to determine the local phase portrait. You could also have one of the eigenvalues at zero. If one of the eigenvalues is zero, the other one has to be real. It can't be imaginary because anything that's imaginary, they have to come in, in pairs. You can have lambda one is lambda not equal to zero lambda two is equal to lambda. In this case, we have only one direction of exponential growth or decay. And the, the details of it depend on what the off diagonal terms of your matrix look like. So this case here would be corresponding to lambda, lambda with a non-zero B here. And that is called a degenerate node. Or you could have the case that for b equals zero, that means a is just lambda, lambda. In this case, I've done you know lambda less than zero. Suppose we do the case where lambda is greater than zero. The b equals zero means that things are just happening symmetrically. So all directions are expanding out equally. This is this shape is called a star or this type of fixed point. It's 
called a star. We can summarize by doing a classification of fixed points of the delta tau plane, the determinant and the trace. So here is a, here's a picture. We'll do the delta axis, and then this is tau. And remember what these were. This is the, the trace of A matrix, and delta is the determinant of the A matrix. So in here, there's a special curve. This corresponds to tau squared equals four delta. And in each of these regions, we can say what it is. If delta is less than zero, you have a saddle point. Delta less than zero, you have saddle points. Up here, we have unstable spirals. Below this, we have stable spirals. Above this frontier, above the unstable spirals, you have unstable nodes. And down here, stable nodes. So all of these that you know fill an open set in this plane are the more are the generic ones, the ones that you will tend to get. The special cases are on special lines. Maybe I'll plot this line in orange and give it a name. So this is like that the special case between spirals and nodes. These are the degenerate nodes. And at tau equals zero, this, this is the special case between stable spirals and unstable spirals. So you can kind of guess what's the balance between things spiraling in and things spiraling out. It's things going on endless cycles. So it's the centers. So that's what this case is. So the centers, purely oscillatory. And they're the most common degenerate case, if you want, because they show up in mechanical systems. Uh, but you could also give a name to these points on this edge here, at least in terms of the linear system, delta equals zero means that you've got at least one of your eigenvalues equal to zero. And for that to happen, it means you, you have a case of maybe the whole plane is a bunch of fixed points, or there may be a whole line of fixed points. We could call this a situation of non-isolated fixed points, although it's non-isolated fixed points in just the linear system. So this caveat up here holds. If you have an eigenvalue that's zero, meaning if so, if delta is zero, be careful because you could come to conclusions from the linearization that don't really hold in the nonlinear system. So that is our classification. And it's kind of cool, right? All right, we're going to look at an example. So this gets back to a, it's, I think it's a, a model I presented in the first lecture where we talked about uh, gliding. So this was dynamics of non-equilibrium gliding in animals. I don't know if you remember this picture of, hey, it's a, it's a squirrel or something. And so this is a squirrel jumping and what it does. We were looking in the phase space. In this case, the phase space, um, and we've got phase portraits of what the dynamics look like in the Vx is the horizontal velocity versus Vz, which is you know, downward velocity. And in this case, we would sometimes get a f one fixed point or multiple fixed points. And we started classifying them by, are they a stable spiral and so on. We came up with our own thing related to the lift and drag curves. So this is a very similar looking diagram to what we just made. Um, but this is saying for the lift and drag curves and things related to their properties, this tells you what kind, and this is evaluated at a glide equilibrium point. This tells you what kind of dynamics it looks like. And I think we found all of these. So we had saddle points, stable nodes, stable, here we called it a focus instead of a spiral. That's another term that you could use. Some books say spiral, some words, some say focus. So we found all of these different types of behaviors and then we did, uh, it was just based on what these lift and drag curves look like for different things, dragonflies, fish, sugar gliders. Um, so like, here's a saddle point. In fact, here, there's a saddle point next to, I don't know, some kind of degenerate node thing. 